Okay. Welcome. Be together. Came this amazing. came. Okay, let's pray. Be a part. Father, The churros of God. My brother, how much that moment has changed my life. Um, I am so thankful uh, that I got to become a Christian. I was an atheist at that moment, uh, didn't believe in God at all. Those Christians. Stopped me. Truth. If in the cafeteria and the engineering, incredibly thankful to be here. All my dream to work on are now not as important. With me and Mark, well, I should do what you do. And he was like, that wasn't in the discipleship study. <laughs> I have no idea who or what God wants to be able to sit down, open the Bible, and help them figure out that they can go for eternity to heaven. And that became my dream. About a year later, God gave me an opportunity to go on the mission team that planted the church in Kiev. Um, Went there, I did so lousy in Kiev. I was supposed to be on the Kiev mission team, but I did so lousy um, that they decided to, that I probably just needed to start over in St. Petersburg. So I stepped off the Kiev mission team, someone else stepped on, they sent me to St. Petersburg, um, was on the St. Petersburg church planting with Derek and Leanne Vett, and uh, God really humbled me, and I repented the best I could, and uh, God really blessed my time in St. Petersburg. I was there for about nine months, and then moved back to Kiev, uh, the church was about 150 members when I moved back. Um, and then in the next two years, the church grew from 150 to 1,600 uh, members, which was unbelievably rapid growth. Um, so I, we landed at 150. I became boyfriend and girlfriend at 150. We got engaged at 500, and we got married at 800. So that's pretty much how we built our relationship, which was awesome. Uh, God blessed. Um, but then we got kicked, basically kicked out of the country because we were the largest Christian group in the country. Um, and they were sure I was a spy or something, so they decided I needed to leave the Ukraine. So left the Ukraine, went to Moscow, and then God opened up the door for us to be able to start Hope Worldwide um, in Moscow. And we started to work with orphans and the elderly. And uh, Michael Jackson came to our first event, uh, which was encouraging. Um, and then after 10 years in Moscow, being with the Flemings, working with Hope and helping the Moscow church, we moved back to Kiev. Um, and we're able to serve there for 10 years. This is a picture of the Kiev Church, um, an amazing fellowship. Uh, but about six years ago or four or five years ago, we decided that it's time to raise up a, a local Ukrainian lead evangelist. Thanks, babe. You're so thoughtful. Um, what was I saying? Yeah. So we should raise up a national lead evangelist and, and an eldership. And we were very thankful for all the help we got from Wyndham Shaw and Al Baird and Valder Koha. Um, and we were able to raise up elders and a lead evangelist. And we decided to step out of being in the leadership team there in Kiev to focus in on Eastern Europe. And Eastern Europe is a wonderful group of countries, 17 different countries, 220 million people. Everyone has their own language, their own border, their own culture. 
um, you know, uh, and uh, that makes it quite challenging. But we decided with our wife, with my wife, that we wanted to go and spend these next chapter of our life trying to strengthen these smaller churches. The Kiev Church and the Moscow Church were planted with substantial resources and large mission teams, and it was incredibly impactful. Um, but as we tried to plant churches in every country by the year 2000, some teams got sent out much smaller, um, with less resources, and they got a start, they got a root in the ground, but it wasn't enough to create a critical mass to evangelize the nation. Um, and many of those countries are here. Out of our 17 countries, six countries actually have no church at all right now. We need to plant them. Six countries have members, but no full-time leadership. And the other six countries have full-time leadership, but it's been very challenging to get those churches to grow. And now there's no disciples between 18 and 35. Most of the Christians converted 20, 25 years ago. They now have kids. They're growing up, and they're watching the church, and they don't see their... So how do we, how do we make that... How, how do we get these churches to turn around, and we'll talk about that later. So me and my wife basically uh, packed up everything we thought was important into one and a half suitcases, um, and we left our daughter at home. She became an empty nester, um, and she, <laughs> she sent us out. And we said goodbye to our home, but we took our dog in two bags. Um, as you see the very populated airport, this is in the thick of COVID. Um, I think we were the only people there. Um, and uh, we started Revive, which I will talk about in a little bit. But right now, I wanted us to jump back into the Bible about talking about living in Christ. Amen? I have four simple points. Number one is it all starts with Jesus. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Try to wrap your brain around that phrase. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. Stunning thoughts. Everything that you can possibly, everything that a human, finite human brain could possibly understand about God, its fullness is demonstrated in Jesus. There's lots of things about God that we can't understand, and they're not demonstrated in Jesus because we're not capable of understanding these things, because we're not, we're not spirit. But we can learn everything we need to know about God by learning about Christ. Christ is the fullness. He's the perfect reflection. When you see Jesus, you're getting to see God in a way that we can understand God. The poor Old Testament, how people tried to explain, from a human point of view, tried to explain who God is. It'd be like me trying to explain to you Beethoven's music. Give me a piano and I would brutally display Beethoven's music and you would think, why do people like Beethoven? Like, what is that? <laughs> but it's the best I could do. And the prophets, the best they could do, but nobody could reflect God the way Jesus does. Jesus is the Son of God. He has all deity in the bodily form. Amen? He is the key to our life. He's our hope. He's where we go. This is the, we, we want to think like Jesus. We want to act like Jesus. We want to speak like Jesus. We want to learn how he thinks, how he acts. What would he do? We want our life to become about Christ. We want to be more and more filled with Jesus. Um, I love the chosen. I'm not going to talk about it. But I love trying to figure out what would Jesus do, how would he act, and to try and be more like him. Let us never be bored with Jesus. Let us never be bored reading the Gospels and closing our eyes and meditating on it and thinking, what would Jesus, how would he act in this exact situation? Jesus can totally change our lives. There's nothing impossible for us because of who Jesus is. An introvert who's terrible at languages, who changed majors from pre-med to engineer to avoid a public speaking class. I've totally changed. Now, unfortunately, my sinful nature is right here next to me all the time. I haven't gotten away from that. But my whole exist, my whole reason for being, my whole life, even the things I do today are so different than what I was doing before I was a Christian. And I know you have the same story. Amen, church? You know, in Rio, they got this figured out. You're never lost in Rio because all you have to do is find Jesus. 
<laughs> okay, I'm lost. Where am I? Oh, oh, there's Jesus. Okay, that means my home's over there. Like, no matter where you are in your day, if you find Jesus, you know where to go. You know where you are and you know where to go. That's how we need to function. No matter where you are in your day, no matter what situation you're in in your life right now, Jesus is the perfect answer to get you back on track or get you to where we need to be. Amen? Amen. Now, throughout my little lesson, I'm going to throw out just some ministry tips because I know many of us here are full-time in the ministry and we're doing ministry. I just want to throw out some, some tips. Um, every situation you're in, everywhere you're at, try to see how God is working. One of the things we do with the Revive team is when we come together for a meeting, we talk about how is God building your faith. We don't share good news. We share about how is God building your faith. We want everything to be connected with how God is working. Um, train our churches and train ourselves to notice God in every situation. How did God work in your life yesterday? Well, I don't know. Look for it. What you look for, you find. Then you start to pray more specific because you want God to, you're thinking about how God can work today through your faith. Let's continue to build our faith. Um, then your relationship with God becomes much more than a quiet time. It becomes a journey. You're all day in a relationship with God because you're noticing how he's working and what he's doing in your life and how he's taking care of us. Amen? Amen. Another practical thing. Uh, our ministries and our lives need to be so much prayer focused. Some of the things we've talked about is praying for each other daily. My wife is incredible because she has a list of like a thousand people that she prays for every day. She just prays for people all the time. Many of your kids, people you know, people that have fallen away, people who walk away, just praying for people. The power of praying daily for each other. I get into my small group and I said, look guys, we, maybe we won't pray for the entire church every day, but we're going to pray, for, we're going to have each other's backs in prayer every day. Um, with the Revive team, we also talk about the ministry of prayer. There's your quiet time, but then there's also the ministry of prayer. It's when you're, you know, you look at Paul, if you study out Paul's prayers, that guy was discipling everybody from a jail cell. And he was doing it all through prayer. And I have this weird thought, which I cannot prove in any way, shape, or form, that you're actually so much more powerful praying for people's change in their hearts than you are talking to them. And if you just put him in jail, he'll spend all day praying for everybody every day about wisdom, knowledge, understanding, this, that, this, and perseverance, and this, and that, that, that. I mean, the things Paul prayed for people. He was leading the movement from a jail cell. And he was discipling people all over the world through his prayer life. How is my ministry of prayer? So we do, I do, I, you know, maybe it's because I've gotten older, but we really prioritize our relationship with God. With, with the Revive team, our staff meetings don't start till 11 because from 9 to 11, that's actually the most important appointment of your day. That's your quiet time. Get a good eight hours of sleep, have some breakfast, but then from 9 to 11, sit at the feet of God. Pray, study, journal, meditate. Sometimes we get so busy that we, tr we don't even have time in the morning for a solid, restful, thoughtful engagement with God. Make a priority with our quiet times. It's the most important two hours of your day. Amen. Or hour. <laughs> or half hour. Whatever. <laughs> but let's not be legalistic. But prioritize it. Amen. It's an appointment. It's actually in your calendar. It starts, it doesn't really finish, but it, it has a start, it, it's a start and it's your time with him. Amen? Amen? I did want to say a big thanks to some of our global prayer warriors. There's some people here that when COVID hit, we started a prayer, a nightly prayer time, where literally almost every day for a year we came on and prayed for everybody who was getting sick and trying to track all these lists of who's sick and who's getting healthy. And God, I believe God worked through the prayers of our global saints 
to bring healing to many of our brothers and sisters around the world. It kind of faded out, and then the war started, and I start, we started a new nightly prayer time, prayer for peace. And um, I really believe there's this unbelievable weapon that God has put in the hands of his fellowship to fight these battles, to really pray. You know, one of, the, one of the fruits of the prayer, I believe, this is uh, the house of our brother and sister in Bucci or Irpin. I don't know which one. But basically, 2 o'clock in the morning, um, their dog started to bark downstairs, which at 2 in the morning, the dog never barks, but the dog barks. So the mom gets out of bed and walks down the stairs, and as she's walking down the stairs, a rocket goes through the roof, goes through her bed, and out the other side of the house and did not detonate. And this is the hole in the roof. There's literally a hole right through her bed where she was laying 30 seconds before. And she survived. <laughs> Prayer. We've got to keep praying for each other, praying for this lost world, praying for peace. Amen? Um, point number two, it's all about love. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. <clears throat> Amen? This is a group of chosen people by God. Seven billion people on this planet, and you're sitting in this hall or you're online. God has chosen you. God has chosen you to do something that only th God through you can do. God has a dream to save this world. He wants everyone to have a chance to be saved. So he, he chose a team that's going to do that with him. Amen, church? It's unbelievable how much God believes and trusts us. Then it says, holy and dearly loved. And I want to camp out on dearly loved. You are dearly loved. You're not just loved. You're dearly loved. I'm not quite sure exactly how much that amplifies it. God loves you. If you don't hear anything at this conference, please hear God loves you. In my mind, that's kind of how all Christianity boils down to is us figuring out how much God loves us and then passing that on to other people. God loves us. Our task is to become excellent communicators to other people about how much God loves them and excellent communicators of how much God loves our fellowship and loves our brothers and sisters. We should find a million ways to say it. Find a million ways to say God loves you. To your neighbor, to each other. I know this is very risky with COVID, so put on your mask if you need to. But let's stand up and just five different people around you, give them a little squeeze or a hand bump and say, God loves you. And look them in the eye and tell them, God loves you. You. <clears throat> Donald. Oh, come on. We're good then. We should hang out. Okay. Okay, let's be seated. Let's be seated. That was very risky. Okay, let's be seated, let's be seated. Very risky, very risky. This is a hug, this is a hug crazy group of people. You gotta love hugs. There's, there's, there, it's almost, it, there's never a moment where I don't, if I preach that I don't make everybody give up, get up and give at least five to 10 hugs. And the poor visitors, by the time they get through the welcome and everything, they know God loves them. I mean, they're, <laughs> the Bible's not open and they're convinced because 10 people have squeezed them and told them that God loves them. So, 
This is us. We're compassionate. We try to be kind, humble, right? Gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and all these things are wrapped up in love. Amen? Amen. You know, on this last Revive team, we've had South Africa, Ukraine, Russia, UK, USA, Israel, Canada, Denmark, Australia, ages from 17 to 76. And you have 10 months together. So when we land, we kind of make an agreement. We are going to do everything we can every day to love each other as much as we possibly can. And every opportunity that we can possibly take to encourage each other, anything we see that's even good, let's talk about it. And go up and tell that person and share. No sarcasm, no putting people down, no silly jokes. No laughing at someone's accent. No laughing at someone's English as their second language. No, none of this, none of this stuff. We just don't have time for it. We've got to go out and battle against a lost country. The last thing we need to do is come home and be goofy with each other with foolish talk. Let's get each other at our maximum encouraged and loved moment that we've ever felt like we've ever been in, in our entire life. That's the goal. And we're just going to fill them up with these incredible quiet times and then incredible meetings of encouragement and inspiration. And then we're going to turn around and go out to this world who is on the verge of so much pain and destruction. And we're going to go battle, then we're going to come home and rest and have fun. That's life. So that's my ministry tip. Make your ministry about encouragement. You can't be too encouraging. You, you, it doesn't mean you don't talk about the things you have to talk about. We'll talk about the things we have to talk about, and we'll do it gently, patiently, lovingly, kindly. We're not going to overlook it, but we're going to do it in a way that we're building each other up, and every step along the way, we feel like we're taking it higher and higher and higher. Amen, Amen church? Amen. Number three. Love is suffering. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. You know, Paul says here he's rejoicing about the suffering. I don't know. That's, that's, that's amazing. Um, it says here, what's lacking in Christ's afflictions? And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Are you putting down the Lord? Because I think the Lord was pretty afflicted. Um, no, it's not that Jesus was lacking in something. It's just his body, the, the building of the church, that process doesn't end. His disciples come in and then also sacrifice. And so we continue. The way Jesus was sacrificing and breaking his body to build the church, we continue to sacrifice and break our bodies in the same way. As we continue to build up the church, which is the body. Amen? And I just want to talk one second about the church. Um, our tendency is to sometimes swing. And there was a moment in time where we probably preached more about the church than we did about Jesus, which wasn't good. But now I feel like we've lessened the significance of the body of Christ in the church. And in Matthew 16, we won't look there, when Jesus says he's the Messiah, which means he's here to save the world, the immediate question in everyone's head is, how? How do you plan on saving the whole world plus those in Orlando 2,000 years from now? Like, what's the plan? <laughs> like, we love great declarations of saving the world, but then the question is, so how are we going to do that? Well, Jesus actually had the answer, and he put it right there. He said, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build my church. The church is the plan to save the world. That is the plan. It's plan A and it's plan A. There's no plan B. And the amazing thing about the church is when you go to the scriptures and you become like the disciples in the Bible, then you're reproducing God's church. Now, our culture has messed with our minds a little bit. We think church has an address. Church doesn't have an address. 
Church is a group of people that decided to be followers of Jesus. They're the disciples. That's, that's what you call church. Three disciples together. Oh, that's church. That's, that's the body of Christ. Those are people living like Jesus. It's not an address. And it definitely doesn't have a start. And the idea of when is church over? Church doesn't end. Church this morning woke up. It took its medicine, brushed its teeth, combed what's left. That's church. Then church got in a taxi. Church came to this conference. Church is fired up because he's with his other churches. We're church. We don't come and go. We don't start and stop. It's not an address. It's wherever I am. That's church. And the church has the keys to the kingdom of God. You go get in a taxi, you have the keys to the kingdom of God, and that driver is going to have a chance to know there's a, that there's actually keys to the kingdom of heaven. Because I'm going to say something. Or not. But we have the keys. He gave us the keys. The church is the instrument to save the lost world. Amen, church? Amen. We've got to come out of COVID. We've got to come out of this TV church thingy. I know, okay, it's risky. Yes, well, it was risky to go to church in the first century. What the heck? You go to church and you wind up in a coliseum with lions. Yeah, I think it is a little riskier. I'm not saying let's be irresponsible. Right? But the church is the instrument to save the world. The world's not going to get saved. And it says, spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And do not be in a habit of missing meetings. And then it's very interesting that the verse that follows that, about don't be in a habit of missing meetings, is if we deliberately keep on sinning, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. That's the verse that follows don't miss meetings. Wow. I've only found two verses in the New Testament that talk about you're not going to get forgiven. One of them is if you don't forgive others. The other one is if you stop coming together to spur one another on towards love and good deeds and saving a lost world. If that's no longer interesting to you, if you're no longer interested, if our church is no longer interested in coming together to get spurred on, to get love, get encouraged, get inspired, and go out there and share the keys with somebody, if we're not interested in that anymore, then no sacrifice for sins is left. Amen. Let's just repent. Change our mind. This isn't a negative thing. We all signed up for Christianity because we wanted to change the world. We just have to get back on board. Amen, church? You know, I wanted to introduce you to Noah, and I don't know if you guys know this story, Noah and Stefan, a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old, they went swimming on their boogie boards in Florida, and um, unfortunately, they got caught in a riptide, and they got pulled out, and they started yelling and screaming, and the mom stood up after like 10 minutes looking for the kids and saw them kind of waving their arms. So mom jumped in to go save them. And then mom got caught in the riptide. And then grandma. Grandma decided to help out. Grandma jumps in the water, swims out. She gets caught in the riptide. She starts to freak out and has a heart attack. And they put grandma on the boogie boards as they're getting pulled out to sea. So as they're yelling and screaming, finally somebody on the beach who understands riptides and everything understood what was happening. And they started to gather people up off the beach and they said, grab arms, we're going to go out and save them. And 80 people reached 80 meters, 80 yards, almost 100 yards into the ocean and grabbed at that point, which was like seven people. A couple people, strong swimmers, swam over to save them, but even a strong swimmer by yourself is going to get sucked out. But all together, they grabbed them, then they walked the line back in until everyone was on the beach. And everyone was saved. Grandma went to the hospital. She survived the heart attack. There were high fives and hugs. These people are complete strangers, but they're, they're like family now. Why? Because they just saved people's lives. When we get about our purpose, we're going to be family. When we're not about our purpose, there's a million things that will divide us. Amen, church? 
I also love the illustration of the redwood trees. Maybe you guys know this, maybe you don't. Um, redwood trees grow really tall. Like, look at this. 300, 400 feet, like 100 meters tall. It's taller than Big Ben and the Statue of Liberty, to not offend anybody from the UK or the US. Very big trees. Now, usually trees, their roots go down almost as deep as they are tall. So you would think a redwood tree that stands for, these things live 2,000 years. You would think the, the roots of the redwood tree must go so deep to be able to hold up such an incredible tree. But the truth is they're only six feet deep. The redwood tree's roots are only six feet deep. And they live for 2,000 years and stand 100 meters, 300 feet tall. How is that possible? Because their roots go sideways. They grab a hold of each other, and the redwood trees hold on to each other. And that's why they can endure any storm. This is God's church. We grab a hold of each other. We don't let go of each other. And no matter what storm, what fire, whatever's happening, we stand because we hold on to each other. Amen, church? Amen. The church goes on rescue missions. You can't do it alone. That whole idea of personal fruit. No, we're, we're a body of Christ. We do this together. We bring people into Christ together, then we hold on to each other. Amen, church? Amen. And finally, for conclusion, not of this world. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Amen? The goal is eternity. You have died. Very sorry about that. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if you didn't. Your identity, who you are, your culture, your diplomas, your race, your everything died. It's gone. In your place was resurrected a mini Jesus. A Jesus follower, a Jesus reflector, a Christian. Amen, church? Amen. Our mind and our citizenship is in heaven. Don't forget that you've already had your funeral. The old you is gone. The new you is here. Amen, church? Amen. This is good news. Your life is now hidden. I can't find you. Where's Sean? I don't know. I don't see. Where is he? Where is he? He's gone. Can't find him. Gone. Disappeared. Not coming back. Well, every once in a while he comes back, unfortunately. <laughs> But you know what I'm saying, right? We're... Christ is now here in your place. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about the Revive team uh, that I've gotten a chance to be a part of. Um, like I said, there are great churches across Eastern Europe, but they were, they were a little bit stuck. Um, and for years I've been asking people to move to Eastern Europe and help us out. Hey, would you come? Hey, do you want to come? Hey, do you want to come? And some people think, oh, maybe I should come. And as they open up the map of Europe, on their way to Eastern Europe, they kind of get stuck in Italy or France or... <laughs> like they almost made it. And you know, Hollywood doesn't help because every exciting CIA movie that you've ever watched or whatever, it's somebody from part of my part of the world that's trying to blow up the world or has kidnapped somebody's kid. So we, we have a reputation of people don't really want to come to our part of the world. Um, so at a meeting, we came together and tried to strategize, come up with some ideas, how can we really impact these churches? And this idea came up with, what if you, what if you had a team of like 15 young people that would just hit the campuses and reinvigorate a youth ministry? And what if, what if you brought in then some, also some people who are training to be church leaders that you could raise up and walk with them? And what if then we also brought in some older couples that could help us with the parents and the older Christians in the church and also shepherd and mentor the, the young people that have come over? What if you did that for like 10 months? And, and what if you, Sean and Lena, would go, you know, from country to country and take these teams and train them and raise them up, but really help those churches turn around? And when this idea was starting to get kicked around, I was like, first of all, nobody's coming to Eastern Europe. I said, I've been trying this for 10 years. <laughs> They're like, yeah, but if it's a bigger team and it's all together and you guys go with them, then maybe they'll come. And I was like, but how could we possibly afford that? How are you going to afford? And one of the brothers was like, 
they can raise their own money. I was like, really? Okay, first of all, it's 10 years I haven't gotten anyone to move, and now they're going to pay for themselves? It's like, okay. I was just seriously lacking faith, I think. Um, and I said, so, okay, so let's try it. We basically put on a map, what are we looking for? Okay, and this is, you know, we talked to Chris and Ann of Stathian from Worcester, and we said, we're not going to do this if you guys don't come with us. And they're like, okay, we'll come. Um, so that's basically everyone we had when we started. <laughs> that, that was the team. But we put out the word and we said, who would want to come, raise your own money, and, and join the Revive team? And God blessed, in January, we had a full team of 26 people. So this is in February. We're all very fired up to do this international traveling and trip, and we're going to raise money, and everything's going to go great. And about one month later, then COVID hit. And now people have to raise money, ask people for money who somebody's in the hospital, and somebody's going to lose their job, and businesses are shutting down, and so much insecurity. And also, this team is about to quit their job for 10 months. Who quits their job for a year in the beginning of COVID and not have something to be able to come back to? Who steps out of school? Who are these crazy people? <laughs> they were truly crazy people. And I thought, oh, guys, there's COVID. So we're still going to do this. And I was thinking, people are going to, like, disappear from my Zoom screen. <laughs> Everybody stayed on. I was like, okay, yes, yes, we're doing this. Now, so we, we stayed engaged. They did the fundraising, and unbelievably, the entire team raised all the money to go. And some team, one team member even sold their car to be able to help pay for somebody else who didn't have enough money. Everyone was all in to get that team over there. So I was incredibly inspired by them. Um, we had decided we are going to land in Budapest, Hungary. We were very excited to revive the Budapest Church, 100 members. They were excited to have us. Summer was going through, and two weeks before launch, we waited for two weeks before launch to buy tickets because COVID could do anything. You never know. But two weeks before, we said, okay, if it's a green light, two weeks before, we go. And we were all praying and fasting. We were fasting every day. We had a fast chain. It came to two weeks. All lights were green. Boom, let's go. Quit your jobs. Give notice. Get out of your apartments, move into your home, pack your bags, say go your buys, step out of your D groups. You're now, we're, we're launched. We are launched. Two days later, Hungary closes the border. I got 26 people without a job. We get on the Zoom call. I was like, guys, we're not going to Hungary. We're going to land in Odessa until Hungary opens. <laughs> and everyone's like, okay, yeah, let's do it. That's what we're going to do. We're going to land in Odessa, and, then, and then, then we'll be good. Then we'll get, we'll get to Hungary. So everyone's getting ready. They're buying their tickets for Odessa. Three days later, Odessa, or Ukraine announces that they're closing their border in four days. And I was like, okay, guys. Go now. Now. You've got to land here in the next four days or the door's going to shut and you're going to get turned away. Go now. And then within 12 hours, the Ukraine announced, no, we're not going to do four days. We're going to do it in two days. And it's like, stop, stop. Don't buy the tickets. Don't. People were literally turning in their cars around, heading for JFK. They were going to leave their car in the parking lot and the keys on the tire to get on the plane to go to try and get there. One brother got in a bus, was driving, literally crossed through the Russian border and at that moment, the Ukrainian border shut, and he was in between the two borders. <laughs> and he couldn't get in, and he had to go back and got in the bus and went back. Literally, the door shut again. So then we get on the phone again with her. I said, guys, we're not going to Odessa. We're going to Istanbul, Turkey. And I thought, we're definitely losing the team this time. There's <laughs> And then they're all fired up, but then they go talk to their parents. Like, who in the world is this guy leading the Revive team? <laughs> You've changed three countries in seven days. Can I talk to this guy? Where is my kid going? So we all landed in Istanbul. We landed in Istanbul. Three weeks later, the Ukraine reopened its doors. We jumped back over to the Ukraine. The team landed there, and we realized that we were in the Book of Acts 16, 
We were in one place, we went to Istanbul on our way to Odessa as we wait for our documents to Hungary. And the documents to Hungary never came. Odessa was in lockdown, then not locked down. COVID was everywhere. Schools were shut down. Universities were shut down. And we brought 26 people who don't speak the language for cold contact evangelism. <laughs> not the smartest strategy I've ever heard. But it's a situation God put us in. We found a cafe. It's called the Mary Berry. And we decided to do, let's just go there, guys. We're going to reach out there. We're going to bring our studies there. We're going to bring visitors there. We're just going to take over this cafe. After about a month, they started to block off parts of the cafe just for our team. And then on Sunday, they literally blocked out half the restaurant. There was literally 100 people with visitors. That's, that's a picture of the Revive team, some of the youth from the Odessa Church, and all of our visitors, and actually the staff of the Mary Berry. <laughs> They came and jumped in the picture too because we were already family. And we st I studied the Bible with one of the guys there. His name was Edward. And I said, Edward, tell me, what do you think about the church? He said, I really like the Mary Berry Church of Christ. <laughs> he said, what a cool group. I've never seen a Mary Berry. I've never seen a church like the Mary Berry Church of Christ. <laughs> it was unbelievable. And it resulted in many people becoming Christians in lockdown with not knowing the foreign language. So proud. Some of those people from that 1.0 team are in this hall right now. If you could stand up, if you're on Revive 1.0, and we can just see you and say hello to you. Thanks for being <laughs> Kurt and Michaela. Crazy, crazy people. Crazy faith. So this is actually the last... Sunday, we were all together in Odessa, which is also quite unique because it was actually the first Sunday we actually saw the Odessa church. It was the first time the Odessa church met out of COVID. We literally met the church only on our last day after being there for 10 months, out preaching the word every single day in the city of Odessa. But it was great to see then the ongoing fruit of that. Once Revive left, well, what happens when Revive leave? What happens? Well, the baby Christians and the young Christians and the youth, they decided to call themselves Revive 1.1. And they decided they were going to go do everything that Revive did. So they're out hitting the streets, doing devotionals together, praying. Then they saved up some money and said, let's do a road trip. Let's go visit another one of the churches in the Ukraine that needs help and encouragement. So the whole team packed their bags and headed off to Vinitsa. And then Ina, who's actually sitting here, shared with her faith with a guy at a McDonald's who ended up coming to church. His name's David. And he's a professional soccer player in Poland. And we didn't have any... Polish conversions yet after the church had been there for four or five years. David comes to church, starts studying the Bible. When the Revive team went home from their one-week journey, he said, I'm going back to Odessa with you guys. And he came to Odessa, continued to study the Bible, went to Warsaw, studied the Bible with Vanya, um, and became a Christian. And now he's serving in the Warsaw church in Poland from the Revive 1.1 team. God had a plan. Then 2.5 came, or 2.0 came around. So while we're still doing 1.0, we start recruiting for 2.0 and inviting people to come to the next country, which is going to be Zagreb. We are headed for Zagreb. And this time, the team grew from 26 to 36. Uh, the youngest member was four years old. The oldest was 74. During COVID, a 74-year-old woman decided to join us. Unbelievable faith. But this time we learned from experience, so we started to get the Zagreb papers much earlier. <laughs> and it was rolling around August, ready to get our tickets to Zagreb. I said, guys, hold on, hold on, hold on. And it came closer and closer and closer, and we never got our documents to Zagreb. And I said, so where, where can we land? And, and according to the citizenships, the only places we could all land that seemed to make sense was Kishinev, Moldova. <laughs> Kishinev, Moldova. That wasn't even on the list of countries we were thinking of going to. Why is the Lord taking us to Kishinev, Moldova? We had no idea. But we decided to go there until the doors opened to go to Croatia. Those doors never opened, but within a month and a half, we had 100 people studying the Bible in Kishinev. We started to realize that maybe we should just stay here. Maybe God wants us in Kishinev. And then once we realized maybe God wants us in Kishinev, we thought, oh, we don't have documents to stay more than 90 days. We need to get documents. So once again, we start to get documents. Uh, we put them all in. After 21 days, they have to give their answer. Unfortunately, the 21 days ended after 
like on the 23rd of December when people had already gone home for Christmas. So we told people, leave your stuff. The authorities have told us for certain we're going to get our documents. So just leave part of your bags here. You're fine. Go home, visit your families, and we'll be back. Um, but on the off chance that we don't get back, because we all know this is a revive and anything can go and revive, let's just plan on meeting in Odessa. Get your return tickets to Odessa, then we'll take a train over to Moldova if we get our documents. And as fate had it, we got rejected on the 23rd. They did not renew, they did not give us Moldovan documents. So we landed in Odessa, celebrated New Year's of 2022 in Odessa. Um, after being in Odessa for two weeks, we were only supposed to be there for five days. We stayed for two weeks because we were waiting for the documents that still hadn't come. But at this point, I'm now getting daily letters from the U.S. Embassy telling us we're at a level three warning that there's going to be an invasion of the Ukraine and we need to get out of the country. Level one is do not visit. Level two is get out of the country. Level three is we cannot protect you. You're on your own. And we said if we hit a level three warning, then the team goes. Level three warning hit. The next day we had our tickets to go to Istanbul. And that next day also Ina baptized her sister. So we were actually in Odessa as long as it took to baptize Ina's sister who was on the team. So she got baptized. We were all in the airport. We flew to Istanbul. We're either going to be there seven days or 60 days, depending on whether we get our documents or not. We're either going to be there shortly or we're going to be evangelizing a 99.9% Muslim country. Um, we were praying, fasting, praying, fasting. Slava's like, don't worry, we're going to get our documents. They've guaranteed it. No problem, no problem, no problem. The day before the day, Slava goes in and the director says, I'm not signing the documents. I don't know who you are. I don't know why you're here. We're not approving you. Slava goes home completely distraught, discouraged. He's incredibly upset. Oh, this is us in Istanbul. Slava goes to his garage. He has a garage, kind of like there's a bunch of garages together. And he just goes to a garage when he gets really discouraged. It's 10 o'clock at night. He's discouraged, goes to the garage. He starts to feed some homeless dogs that are in the area. That's what he does to encourage himself. <laughs> Slava's amazing. Feeding some, some homeless dogs. And then this guy walks up one of the, the, the garages next to him and says, hey, Slava, you look really down. What's up? And Slava starts to share the situation. And this guy says, well, maybe my, maybe my wife could help. And Slava's like... How could your wife possibly help? And he's like, well, actually, my wife was in charge of the anti-corruption group that investigated the Department of Immigration last year. And she was actually the one who fired the director of the Department of Immigration. She could go in and talk to them. <laughs> Slava's like, you got to be kidding me. So Slava called her right there from the garage, and she said, tell me, so why are they rejecting you? She said, well, they won't tell us. They didn't tell us the first time they rejected us. They don't tell us the second time. She said, I can go in there tomorrow. She walks in there at 9.30 in the morning. Slava's waiting in the lobby. <laughs> she talks to the director. She comes out 10 minutes later, and the guy's signing every single one of our <laughs> permits. What a miracle. The entire team landed into Kishinev. I don't think there's ever been in the history of Moldova a happier group of people to come to Moldova. I think that was an unprecedented level of joy crossing the border. Uh, as we walked into the hotel now, almost 11 o'clock at night, this is what the church had prepared for us. Ryan's birthday too that day, so incredibly encouraging. God bless the next 18 weeks we saw 18 people become Christians in Kishinev. You know, four weeks later there was war. The Ukraine was invaded and then all of a sudden several things became clear. Why did we end up in Odessa, not Budapest? Why did we end up in Moldova, not Zagreb? The Revive team was in Odessa building relationships with the church. Then the Revive team was moved to Moldova to get ready to take the Odessa church in its most challenging 
moment. And all of a sudden, it all clicked. We're exactly where God wanted us at the exact time in the exact place. I immediately that morning, once the bomb started to hit, I go to the director and I said, I need your entire hotel. I need every room in this hotel. We need all 130 beds because my friends are coming. And the Odessa church started to come and refugees started to come. And the director has been unbelievable. He's like one of our best friends. And he cleaned out the hotel, got it ready for us. We were able to provide around 15,000 hot meals and 6,000 warm beds and showers for brothers and sisters, friends and family, and people who fled from the war out of the Ukraine. Amen. Thank you for your sacrifice to hope, to the EMS, and just your collaborative, our global fellowship coming together to meet the needs. It's been unbelievable how God has worked through that little hotel. Amen. Then we had teen camp, which was incredible. 43 Moldovans, 43 refugee kids who came across the border for teen camp. Also, my daughter got married in Revive 2.0. <clears throat> That's one of the fringe benefits of Revive. If you're considering Revive, we can't guarantee it, but it can happen. <laughs> Kurt and Michaela also got married, which is an incredible couple um, who were on Revive 1.0 and 2.0. Um, and also, it was amazing because when they went in to get married in Moldova, basically... If you're not Moldovan, you can't get married in Moldova. You have to go to the Ukraine to get married, and they can't go back to the Ukraine to get married. So my daughter's Russian and American, her husband is Ukrainian, and we're living in Moldova. And they're like, we don't, we've never done that. We don't do that. And then one of the girls who got baptized, she had a friend who was a lawyer, and the lawyer was reading the Constitution, and actually the Constitution doesn't say it's against the law. So when they went in to get their marriage license, they said, we don't do that. And they said, well... Actually, according to the Constitution, it should be allowed. And the head of the, the marriage thing said, hold on a minute. Went to another room and made a call, came back in 20 minutes and said, okay, we'll marry you. And they were the first non-Moldovan couple to ever be married in Moldova. So God is good. You know, watch this video. This is all the souls that have been touched. That's ice in the background, by the way. refugee who came across the border with her son who just happened to land in our refugee center and uh, she's a doctor and she became a Christian and she became the doctor for our refugee center. This is Ira. She was a professor at a Russia, teaching Russian in Odessa. And uh, she decided to be helpful as a refugee and teach our Revive team how to speak Russian. Um, and she tried to teach it so that it made sense for them and taught them how to share their faith and study the Bible and all these different things. Uh, and through that, she also started to study the Bible and she got baptized. So five refugees all together became Christians. <laughs> it's like you're in outer space. Amen. God is good. Amen. I want to close with this verse. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Guys, we don't shrink back. Thank you for your perseverance. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving your life to Christ. Thank you for living your life in Christ. Thank you for inspiring 
other people to live their lives in Christ. Don't shrink back. That literally means lowering the sail. When a storm comes, you lower the sail so that the boat doesn't get turned over. When the storm's over, you've got to raise the sail. Otherwise, you just drift. We've got to raise our sail. There's a movement individually in our churches. Let's raise our sails and get dreams to do great things for God. Amen? Pray for us. Um, God blessed me last week because basically everything I own fits in one suitcase, and I brought that suitcase with me to America, and uh, Delta lost it. Uh, so I literally had nothing, um, which is a very interesting feeling. Um, but God blessed as we landed in Orlando, um, as we're waiting for a taxi, I get a call from Delta, and Delta says, we found your bag. Because three days before that, they had no idea where it was, somewhere in Amsterdam. And uh, they said, we found your bag. I said, oh, wow, great, where is it? They said, it's in Orlando. It's at the baggage claim. They said, where are you? I said, I'm at the baggage claim in Orlando. <laughs> so it was literally arrived right when I, my plane landed. And actually, I told them to deliver my bag to New York. So I thought I was going to New York. I was in New York for two days, Richmond in two days, and then I came to Orlando. And somehow my bag landed in Orlando the moment I landed. So the Lord just, another hug and kiss from the Lord. He loves us. Um, those are all the different stickers that took my bag all over the world. My, my bag is now a frequent flyer, uh, all by itself. You know, I don't know what's waiting. This is now Revive 2.5. In exactly 29 days, this team will land in... <laughs> really, am I even going to guess? <laughs> this team is going to land in Kishinev, Moldova. We don't know how long. We don't know if Moldova will be invaded. We don't know if we'll have to evacuate. We don't know what's going to happen. But we do know... That group of 26, that ecclesiast, that church, that body of Christ is just going to radiate God's love. And we're going to share it no matter where that team goes. And we're going to attract as many people as we possibly can to eternal life with Jesus. Please pray for us. Follow us. Support us. Sign up. Um, Warsaw, Athens, Ljubljana, Bucharest, Budapest, Istanbul, Cyprus. These are countries we want to go to in the next four or five years. Are you an empty nester? Are you wanting to take a year to come and have an incredible missionary experience? Think about it. Consider it. Talk to somebody. Come spend a year in Eastern Europe. Let God use you. But in the meantime, revive where you are. All of our churches need revival. Let's live our lives in Christ. There's no better life. Thank you for spending time with me today. I love you guys. Have a great conference. <clears throat>